Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. We just thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, that our lives are in your hand, Lord, that you are the God of this earth, Lord, and that uh, we thank you, Lord, for, Lord, just um, so many blessings and, and um, what we can look forward to, to what you're doing in this earth and, and um, Lord, the future that we have in you. Lord, we've read the end of the book. We know what's happened and we look forward to your coming in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week I just talked about uh, the signs of our times in Matthew 24. And, um, you know, with uh, so much change and things that are happening in this world and, you know, seeing and experiencing things that um, may be uh, a little bit uncomfortable, um, Jesus um, talked to the disciples in Matthew 24 and they said, you know, what is the, what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And so he went through a list of things that they would experience, but he also went through things as an encouragement. And so just to recap, he said that there'll be deception, um, there'll be many that'll come saying they're the Christ, uh, there'll, be war, they'll hear wars and rumours of wars, nations rising against each other, famines, pestilence, earthquakes... Um, they'll, you'll be persecuted and, and killed, the people will be offended and there'll be betrayal and hate towards one another and false prophets, sin will be rampant and the love of many will grow cold and talked about future events. And we recognise that those things are ever more increasing. But there's a list of things that in the midst of that scripture that Jesus says to, to bring encouragement or, or comfort when you see these things happening. And one of the big things he said is, don't be troubled. <laughs> in, in Matthew 24, verse 6, he says, when you see these things, don't be troubled. And so don't let the things of this worth, world trouble you, because he also said that he's coming back. He said, the more that you see things that like this are coming, he said, I'll be coming back, and um, so be ready. He also said to endure, to endure through those times, and uh, those who endure to the end will be saved. And of course, that doesn't mean that you'll only you know, retain your salvation if you endure, but that we will be saved from this earth, we'll be living in a better place. And then he encouraged to continue uh, preaching the gospel, witnessing to all nations, and that heaven and earth will pass away, but his word, word won't, and no one knows the answer. But he also said that it'll be the same as in the days of Noah, and in, in the version in Luke, he says also in the days of Lot. And so he gives this insight into the day of his return that will be like that. And so this is the kind of world that Noah was experiencing when, um, uh, when he was on this earth and he had to navigate that. You and I only lived for uh, maybe 100 years. He had to live through it for something like um, nearly 900 years. He was um, 600 years old when the flood came. And so... He had to navigate through a world that, that um, God had said that things were so bad that he wished he'd never even made man. What a sorry and sad and sorry scripture. But then it says, but Noah in Genesis 6, 8 found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And um, yeah, isn't that wonderful that we, you know, there's that beautiful song we sing, you know, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so when we do spend that time just to look in the eyes of Jesus, what we see is his grace. Um, you remember the lady with the issue of blood who reached out and touched his garment and Jesus stopped and looked at her and what she had done was against the law but when he turned around and looked at her, he saw her in her faith, but she saw him in his grace. She would have looked in the eyes of Jesus and seen grace towards her. And so Noah, even in the midst of God saying, I'm sorry that I've uh, made man, I'm going to judge the earth, Noah looked into God's eyes and he saw grace. He saw the original purpose of God, and that is to be gracious towards men even in the midst of that and of course we know Romans 5:20 says where sin abounds grace abounds even much more so even when Jesus said that sin will be rampant and the love of many will grow cold well you can know that actually there'll be an abundance of grace a supernatural grace for that time and then Noah also his name means rest and comfort so even in the midst of a world that had gone crazy that it got so bad that God said, I wish I'd never even made man. 
Noah was able to find grace and find rest and comfort in the midst of that. And so that's how we can live through this world and not be troubled if you keep looking to Jesus. But also... Um, that whole scenario talks of the long-suffering of God. He picked a man, which was Methuselah, and we're going to talk a bit more about that in a moment. And he said that, um, I will hold back my judgment, and when that man dies, that's when it'll come. And that man was the longest man who ever lived, 969 years. So it shows the long-suffering of God. Because 1 Timothy 2, verse 3 and 4, talks about how God desires that all men will be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God's more interested in grace and salvation than he is in judgment. <laughs> um, Jesus was, uh, when he actually, one of the first times he spoke in a synagogue, he actually was reading Isaiah 61. And uh, he was talking about his mission, that he had come to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captive free, um, bring good news to the poor, and then when he got down to the end, he said, and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he shut the book. And that verse goes on to say, and the day of vengeance of our God. He didn't read that part. But even if he did, it shows me that the acceptable year of the Lord, which is Jubilee, which talks about grace, that's in the framework of a year. But the day of vengeance is a day. So that shows me that God is 365 times more interested in grace and salvation than he is in judgment. <laughs> Isn't that good? Amen. Are you glad about that? I'm glad about that. I really am. So we don't focus so much on the judgment of God because Jesus took that at the cross. We focus on the grace and the love and the salvation of God. And then he said that in Matthew 24 and verse 14. He said, this gospel of the kingdom, and the gospel actually means good news. So he's saying this good news, judgment, there's no good news about judgment, is there? But it's good news about salvation and grace. And so he said, this good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at today something really interesting. I love the word of God, and I love that when you really start to dig into it, you just see um, God's redemption plan over and over and over again in the Old Testament, even before Jesus came, in so many different ways. And so right back in Genesis, when uh, God said that the ground would be cursed and all these things would happen, he talked about how um, the, the woman would um, crush the head of the serpent and then the serpent would crush his heel. And that was a, a messi messianic promise of that that's what Jesus was going to come and do. And then right throughout the Old Testament in different ways, through the sacrificial system, um, through uh, what we're going to look at in a moment, the plan of what God had to send his son Jesus, which was before the foundations of the world, just keeps coming up time and time again. Um, because you know that the Bible is all about history is actually his story. So it's about the story that, that there was a plan that, that God was going to come and send his son. And then when you look at Isaiah um, 53 in different scriptures that, and um, 22, Psalm 22, there's some very you know, amazing scriptures talking about what Jesus was going to do. And so the cross becomes the central part. The Old Testament looks forward to the cross and now we look back to the cross. And so I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1 to 32. Because this is one of these scriptures where the plan of what God had to redeem man by his grace comes out through this. Now you won't see it evident straight away because all I'm going to do is read you a list of people's names. And it's the, the names from Adam through to Noah. But when I start to show you the meaning of the names, so we had... Eden Joy here this morning, you know, and Eden, we all know that Eden is a, a, you know, to do with the Garden of Eden. In fact, my grandmother's name was Edna, and it's the same thing. It's a derivative of Eden. And so you see that her name means delight and pleasure and joy. And so definitely in the Bible, when they made, gave them names, the names had significance. And so today I want to show you that as we start to unravel the, ten, the names between Adam and Noah, and we put them together, you're actually going to see the plan that God always had for man and to redeem him. So we're going to read um, Genesis 5, 1 through to 30, and it's just going to be a list of names, and then we'll unpack that. So this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. 
And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. And after he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years and he had sons and daughters. So they lived a long time back then. We explained the other day, Adam would have got eight letters from the Queen by then, so if the, she was around. Um, and so then it goes on to say, Seth, in verse 6, Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and he had sons and daughters. And so all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. It'd be hard to imagine somebody living that long. Um, I did a funeral on Friday for a man who was 93 and he was a pretty sprightly um, guy. But to think that 10 times that is just beyond our comprehension. Um, and then uh, it says... So the, the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and he begot Canaan and he begot Canaan. Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalalel. And after he begot Mahalalel, Canaan lived 840 years and had sons. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. Mahalalel lived 65 years and got, begot Jared. After he begot Jared, Mahalalel lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years and he died. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. And after he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. Okay, we're starting to get some names that we recognise, Enoch and Methuselah. And he begot Methuselah. Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. He was, his days were shorter because he, God took him... <laughs> In fact, um, a little girl at Sunday school one time explained it this way, and he, she said that uh, Enoch used to meet with God and say to God, come back to my place, and so God would come back to his place, and they would spend time together, and one day God said, well, why don't you come back to my place? <laughs> so he did that when Enoch was 365 years old. <laughs> and Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. So, you know, when you go to God's place, it's a permanent. <laughs> and after he begot um, Lamech, Methuselah lived um, 782 years and had sons and daughters. And so all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. So he was the oldest one. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. He called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. And he begot Noah. Lamech lived to 595 years and had sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died. And Noah was 500 years old when he had his sons Shem, Ham and Japheth. I'm sure you don't hear many people going through genealogies like that. But we're going to go through each one and just have a look at what their name means. And then at the end we'll put it on the screen and you'll actually see how this all fits together. So that's the genealogy. Ten generations from Adam to Noah. So Adam actually uh, means red, but the root is man. So he was the first man. So the root name for Adam is man. Seth actually means, and sometimes you pick it up when, you, uh, when you're reading, they actually describe a bit about the person, but Seth, um, actually the root word for that is appointed or an appointed place. So that's what his name means, that he had an appointed place. Enosh means mortal man or mankind, and another part of the root of that word means an incurable wound or sickness. Okay, so, so Enosh had, um, was, his name means mortal man or mankind or an incurable wound or sickness. The next one, Canaan, actually means possession. And Mahalalel actually means the blessed of God or the praise of God. In fact, if you break that name down, it's Mahalalel. El means God and Mahalalel means blessed or praise. So that's how the Jewish work, they go from right to left. And so Mahalalel 
El means God and Mahalal means blessed. So his name means the blessed or the praise of God. Jared actually um, means descent or to come down or to send down. So that's the meaning of his name. And Enoch means to, uh, to train up. It's two meanings. It means dedicated or the, the root word means to train up. Now Methuselah means his death shall bring or when he dies it shall come. And so uh, it comes from two words. Um, m- so math means death and shalak means to bring. So when you add the two together, Methuselah, the math is death and selah means to bring. So that was interesting because his name means that his death shall bring. What shall it bring? <laughs> it shall bring the flood. It shall bring judgment. And so God marked that man and said that when he dies, I, yeah, I have decided I'm going to bring judgment of the world, of world and I've marked a man and I'm going to make that man live until that appoint that time. And so he was the longest man who ever lived. It's really interesting. I mean, you know that Methuselah, often you know he's the longest man that ever lived, 696 days. But... Uh, years, sorry. <laughs> I won't try to work out the days. But um, the fact that, that that's what his name means, means that that shows the long-suffering of God. It shows that he was holding back. Because Noah preached for 120 years and preached the good news that they could be saved from that judgment. And so when Enoch named him, he named him prophetically. And uh, the year that he died is when the flood came. So Methuselah was 87 when he had Lamech. You, you won't necessarily just find that written in the Bible. This is how you find it. Methuselah was 187 when he had Lamech and then lived another 780, 82 years. Lamech had Noah when he was 100, uh, 182 and the flood came in Noah's 600th year. So if you add 187, 182 and 600 together you actually get 969. So that's how you know. The Bible tells you he was that old, but you don't always know that's when the flood came. You can actually add those numbers together and you'll find that that's what happened. So it's interesting that his life, in effect, is a symbol of God's mercy in stalling the coming of the judgment of the flood, and it is fitting that his lifetime is the oldest in the Bible, symbolising the extreme long-suffering of God's mercy. Isn't that wonderful? I love that. You know, and the Bible says that in uh, one of the fruits of the Spirit is patience or long-suffering, something that we know has to be a fruit of the Spirit because it's something that doesn't come naturally, and, um, but it's very much an attribute of God. So we've got two left. Lamech, well, the root of our English word lament or lamentation, which is where Lamech comes from, suggests despair. And so his name means um, despair, but then Noah's name means rest or comfort. Actually, in in Genesis 5, 29, we just read it, it says, He will be called Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the curse which the Lord has cursed. So it actually means comfort and rest from the curse. So so what we're going to do, Samuel, if you can just click that um, button and we should display be able to display that. Can everyone see that? So now you're going to see how uh, their names shows God's redemption plan. So first of all it says, um, so I'm just going to go to the right hand side because we've already said the names. So man was appointed, so appointed where? To this earth. So God made man and gave him dominion over the earth. So he appointed him to this earth. But then when he sinned, he became mortal man. Who knows that if Adam hadn't sinned, he would have lived forever. And so when he sinned, God said that when you eat of, if you were to eat of this tree, you will surely die. He didn't drop dead at that moment, but spiritually he did. He was disconnected from God. And so So man was appointed to this earth, but then he became a mortal mortal man, and that became his possession. (laughs) 
Our position is that now we are a mortal man, that we um, don't live forever. We have to, to do that, we have to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. So that became the possession of man. And also, if you remember that, um, if we go back here, um, the word Enosh, which is um, mortal man, actually means an incurable wound or sickness. And that's what happened when man fell, that they, sin was an incurable wound or sickness, and that became the possession of man. Not just sickness as in uh, disease, but the sickness that, bring, that sin brings into this world and brings into mankind. So that explains the condition of man and how man got into that condition. But now we actually see God's redemption plan start to kick in. So then the praise of God came down. Who's he talking about there? That's Jesus, amen? Jesus is the praise of God. So he came down and he was, um, sorry that's a misspelling, but he was dedicated and trained. So when he came down, he was dedicated to what? To going to the cross. He had a mission and that was to go to the cross for mankind, to redeem man from sin, to redeem man from this incurable disease or um, sickness, and he was dedicated to that. We know that. You know, we, he healed the sick and he did all those wonderful things. He reached out to the poor, but his mission was to come and die for mankind. And then he, who, who did he train? The disciples. He trained up 12 men who would then carry on that mission after he left. So the praise of God, which is Jesus, came down. He, had, he was dedicated to what God had sent him for, and he trained up the disciples to carry on his work after he left. So then his death shall bring despair, but also rest and comfort. His death brought despair on him. Jesus died on the cross. He was laid on the cross. He actually was nailed to the cross uh, they've said that's one of the most barbaric ways to die and it brought total despair. Jesus dropped drip, um, blood knowing that he was going to go to the cross. And so, and yet even in his despair, he said, my, you know, um, Joyce said that this morning, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There was that um, relation, break in relationship when the, he took the sin of the world upon himself. But also that even in the midst of that, he said, God forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And so his despair brought rest and comfort to us. And so it actually brought rest and comfort to the curse. Jesus, you know, the, the Bible says, cursed is him who hangs on a tree. When Jesus died on that cross, he took all the curse. And so, and, and so that he could actually give us his blessing. He took the judgment of God. And so because of that, because of his despair, and we talk about this most mornings when we do uh, communion, we talk about how Jesus died on the cross, such a despairing act for him, but it brought such rest and comfort for us and for mankind. And like Joyce said this morning, he did that for every person. Not every person understands it, not every person um, believes it or has accepted it, but regardless of whether you believe it or accepted it, he did that for you. And so it can bring rest and comfort for you. In what way? Well, that you know that when you, your life is over, that you'll actually be spending um, the rest of your life in heaven. The Bible says is that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And so out of that um, despair that Jesus came in that beautiful act, we know that we, there's a peace and comfort. And we know that we can have peace with God, not because of what we do or who we are, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And then what that means is that you can live the rest of this life in comfort because you know the judgment of God for sin has actually already been taken by Jesus Christ. So there it is. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah, Man was appointed to this earth, became mortal man by taking from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And let me say to you, I, 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 amazing testimony just to, to share in the middle of this is that, um, and I mentioned this to the ladies the other day, but uh, when earlier this year when we had the floods and uh, we had the family that tragically died in the river here, 
um, I was talking to a lot of media at the time and I was talking to a photographer and uh, he, he actually just called in and um, randomly just called in the other day and uh, he reminded me that we were talking for about an hour and a half, sitting out the back in the monks of mud and all the devastation and, and despair. And um, he was sharing with me, he said, look, I grew up in the Uniting Church. He said, but, you know, Rob, I, I'm really struggling at the moment. I don't understand where is faith in the midst of all this. You know, that family didn't deserve to die. Um, where, is, where does faith, you know, where is God in the middle of all this? And I, I, I looked at him and I said, you know, Here's the thing is that um, little Chloe May, who survived, if you remember the accident, she actually got out of the van as it was, um, the van was going in the water, in the flood of waters, and the mother and the other two children um, passed away. And um, I said, here's how faith works. I said, that, little, that girl, that nine-year-old girl, she's a Christian, she knows Jesus, and so is her mother and so are her other children. We know because we were their scripture teachers for six years. And I said, here's how faith works. I said, that little girl knows that she'll see her mother and she'll see her sister and her brother again. I said, that's how faith works because what an amazing hope that she has. Imagine if she didn't have that hope. For her, it would just be terminal. And so um, I mentioned that to him and I mentioned that at the funeral. Do you know that he said to me, I haven't seen him, it's been six months and he's all been all around the world and, he's, and uh, he met somebody who knows me and so he, he just decided to call in. He said, I would just want to let you know, Pastor Rob, that that conversation turned my life around. He said, I was just drifting. He said, I was like a bottle just bobbing down in the water, just in the river, just aimlessly, just going around. He said, but... When, when he spoke to me and I talked about that, he said, I realised that there is a God who actually has a purpose for my life. And even in the midst of tragedy, God can turn those things around. And if I was to sit down and talk to you, even though in the midst of that tragedy, which was, was hard and we knew them personally, God has done some absolutely amazing things and touched people's lives um, through you know, what he does. God is not the author of evil. Uh, he's the author of good. But... Bad things happen in this world because sin came into this world, because man that was appointed to look after this world brought sin into this world. But God always has a way to turn that around, amen, to redeem man and to bring hope. And so he said, you know, my family and I, we're now you know, following God and we know we have, God has a plan and purpose for our life. Isn't that wonderful? And I was so privileged he didn't have to come back and, and tell me about that. And that's why Jesus said, you know, just keep preaching the gospel. Just keep telling people about that good news. You may never hear from somebody again when you tell them, but, uh, you know, I had that wonderful privilege. felt like, you know, when Jesus healed uh, ten people and one came back and said, thank you, I felt like that moment. But, um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's uh, just so wonderful. And so, um, you know... That's what Jesus did. In the midst of uh, you know, what man had done, he came down, he was dedicated, and, and, uh, but, and he died for us. And in the midst of his despair of diet dying, it brings rest and comfort. And so that's what I was talking about, that, because it's, that's what faith is about. It actually, see, when I, when I actually spoke, I've spoke to so many people about this. Do you know how many people that has actually comforted knowing that, that Chloe May's a Christian, that she'll see her family again? I actually got a letter at the time, and it was from one of the guys who was one of the first on the scene as the rescue party. And he was from Sydney. They had a sum up from Sydney. Uh, so he, he was with the paramedics. He, um, one went into the river, and he was there on the bank. And you can imagine, I mean, my heart goes out to the police and to the paramedics and that that have to see all that stuff going on. Anyway, he sent me an email and he said, uh, Rob, I got home to Sydney and I just hugged my children <laughs> and um, just hugged them and appreciated them. He said, but um, because I'd done some stuff on the media and let people know that they're a, they're a Christian family, he said, that brought so much comfort to me to know that that family are saved to know that they'll, they'll all be reunited again together as a family. And so, you know, isn't that amazing? That's how, that's what faith can bring rest and comfort because we know that when we're finished on this earth, whether it be an accident or be whether we, you know, um, our, like yes, on Friday, a man lived to, he was 93, he was a Christian and was able to bring that same message. The, the comfort that knows that we will one day be with the Lord in a better place my mum and my dad have passed away, but I know that they're just waiting, waiting for me. And do you know what? There's no time in heaven. So, like, for me, 
it's been, uh, I don't know how long, 10 or so years, but for her it'd be, be like, oh, I just got here and you've arrived, you know, like there is, there's no time in heaven. And so um, the wonderful thing is that I know she's in a better place and I know she's with the Lord and one day I'll see her again. That, doesn't that bring comfort and rest? Yep. Does it? Yes. <laughs> it does. So um, we're going to close there, but look, I'm just going to give an opportunity and... Um, I'm not going to make it too awkward, but um, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ in your life, what a better time than now than Christmas where we celebrate that Jesus came for that very reason. Um, he lived on this earth for 33 years, but he, had, he was dedicated to one thing, and that was to actually bring salvation and comfort and rest to the world through. And you know what? He's done it all. He's died on the cross. He's answered the sin question. He's done all that. All you have to do is actually accept him as your Lord and Saviour. So what we're going to do is um, we're, we're just going to break and we're going to have uh, morning tea together. But uh, if that's something you'd like to know a little bit more about, I'd just get, come and talk to me. Um, uh, Doris and Alex, can you just put your hand up up the back? Doris and Alex there as well, and there's other people here. And we, we'd be happy just to show you and lead you in how you can actually do that. It's simply just a prayer from your heart. The Bible says is that if you call upon him, you will be saved. And you can do that in your own bedroom and your own time. And, um, and so it's a, it's a wonderful thing that that whole redemption plan, you can actually find it in the book of Romans. Uh, but in, in Romans, let me just turn to it, chapter 9. There's two, two scriptures here. And I'll just finish on that. My pages are stuck together. Uh, it's 10 verse 9. It says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And verse 13, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's very simple. That's what Christmas is all about. The wonderful gift that God gave to the human race was his son. And so we, all we have to do is actually receive him and then we will have that rest and that comfort in our life and know that we're going to a better place. I'm just going to pray and then we'll uh, go and have some morning tea. So Lord, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, even in the, right back in the Old Testament in these names, you show your wonderful plan for the human race. That, Lord, we came and, and uh, we were appointed on this earth to look after this earth, but, Lord, we messed it up and sin came in. And, Lord, it caused that incurable sickness that we couldn't actually fix ourselves. But you fixed it by sending your son, Jesus Christ. The blessed of God, the blessed of heaven came down and uh, you were, he was dedicated to saving this world. And in his despair on the cross, we can receive rest and comfort through the knowledge and saving grace of Jesus Christ. That is the good news of the gospel. That is what you train the disciples to, to go out into all the world and to teach and what you, even amongst us, ask us to keep doing to let people know that wonderful news. So we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you for this time of Christmas, Lord, where we celebrate when you sent your son down as a babe, Lord, to walk on this earth as a man and to save us. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come and enjoy some morning tea. Yep. Do you want to say something, Damien? Just after some morning tea, um, if anybody wants to join us, we're going to go and have some lunch next door at the um, pub. So, yeah, if you um, haven't got lunch plans, feel free to come along and um, grab a table with us and um, here yeah, to celebrate the day. Fantastic. Awesome. Okay, we'll talk, see you around the back for some morning tea.